Um, and we'll place this up on uh, on the video portal and Blackboard uh, later this week for you to look at if you have any questions. Um, I don't have a little poll today. I usually do polls, but this one I was struggling to think of how to question these things. What we're going to do today is we're going to walk through estimating the weight of a new aircraft. Um, I'm not going to walk through it at the equation level, but we'll talk a little bit about that. We are using just the Breguet range equation inverted and the um, endurance version, similar endurance version for what we would call thrust limited or jet powered aircraft. Again, if you have a question, please raise your hand in the meeting or um, or you can put in the chat and title uh, start your your message in the chat with Q colon and then ask your question. So as I said, this is about estimating the weight of a mom aircraft. This is our middle of the market aircraft. Um, and we're going to use this as our kind of example for all of our, our different things. In a couple of weeks, when we start talking about constraints, we'll talk about the mom aircraft and the constraints and interesting constraints that come off of that based on a couple of airports in the problem session. So when you look at your aircraft and you're developing your tool both to be marked and to be used in anger, when you look at your aircraft, uh, you're going to want to do similar things like this. So we're going to look at several scenarios here and different options and the like. Okay, so um, just a quick recap of the middle of the market and what it means. Um, again, let's get up here. It's this kind of gap in the middle here that used to be the 767, the A310, the 757-300 uh, in terms of range and payload. Um, it's opened up over the years as these aircraft have gone out of being offered. Um, and then as our NEOs and our NEO LRs have come up in capability, they've taken some of the range and some of the payload, but they've not, they've left this open. Because keep in mind, our A330-900 and our uh, 787 are up in this range. Um, and so they're much heavier payload up above 45, closer to 50 tons um, and ranges over 6,000 nautical miles, seven, 8,000 nautical miles in many cases um, and not in the shorter range. So the idea behind the mom is it, it does very well on these kind of what we would historically have considered fairly long range missions, transatlantic, uh, US Midwest, to or North American Midwest, so that's places like Chicago or as far west as the Rocky Mountains, so Denver, Calgary, um, and further east, Toronto, New York, uh, Atlanta, Florida to Europe, um, and the Pacific coast of North America to the uh, Pacific coast of Asia, places like Japan and Korea and the like, not the extremely long range stuff. Okay, so that's the whole. Um, it's this gap here where we are between 25, 27 tons and these lower 40, 45 ton range. Again, 4,000 nautical miles up to about 6,000 nautical miles as we see. Um, we're gonna talk about the single or twin aisle case and the um, airport cases when we do constraints, we do configuration. What we're talking about now is this bit. Um, and specifically, we're gonna look at are 33 to 40 ton, 190 to 225 typical passengers, because that's the way we tended to load out 757-300s seven, seven, and 767-200s, seven, uh, seven, seven, A310s for these, these medium to longer range missions. And we're going to look at the um, 4,000, uh, just over the, the middle range of this as our, as our options. Um, just as a reminder, whenever you do a analysis of an aircraft, work up the weights. You need to build up the entire mission as the, all of the segments. So you have a takeoff, oops. I love when it does that. Takeoff, climb, you can combine all your climbs. These are more for constraints. Our cruise to distance, a descent approach, landing, and then the ability to divert with a hold and a long range cruise over 200 nautical miles um, and the 100 nautical mile. Uh, distance. So remember, we're getting a little bit of credit in both of these cases um, for climb and descent and the like, and we'll talk about that and then our hold at the end. 
So in all of this, you will at first order just make some assumptions as to what the fuel fractions for these segments are here. And you will calculate your cruise and your hold. So your cruise is a range maximizing condition and your hold is an endurance maximizing condition. Anybody remember what the L over D for range maximizing condition is? Don't all speak up at once. So remember, range maximizing condition for a thrust limited or jet aircraft is about 86.6% of L over D max. That's the L over D for that. And then for endurance maximizing, we want to operate at L over D max. So remember that when you're doing your calculations and the like in your spreadsheet. OK. So what are the scenarios we're going to look at to show you how these things work and the changes and, and the outputs in, in payload range diagram? So we're going to look at four scenarios in this case, um, one, two, three, and four. Um, what we have is our small short, our large short, our small long, and our large long. So what that is is small and large are typical payload and maximum payload, and short and long are ranges. So uh, for the short, we're talking 4,000 nautical mile, range at this 190 and 225 passenger, and then the long ones are 5,500 nautical miles. Now, if you know anything about this, you'll know that this max payload is significantly more than that typical payload, because we're not going to be flying 4,000 nautical miles with our maximum payload. We don't do that. And we saw that back a few slides ago when we looked at the um, <clears throat> payload range here. This A321neo LR, while it does have a little bit more fuel, it carries substantially less payload than the A321neo to get that 4,300 nautical miles. So that's that trade you're making, is how much less payload you're carrying and the like. Okay. To give you an idea, um, we'll use um, these tech and mission values. So our aspect ratio on this aircraft will be 11. That's kind of state of the art now, A350 787 size. Now, the key to that, to fit it in an airport, is you're gonna have to be creative. How do you create an aspect ratio of 11? Keep in mind the A320 series and the 737 series are in the high nines, 9.4 to 9.7. How do you create a wing with that high aspect ratio and fit it in your airport? So if you're going to do an 11, you're going to have to be a bit more creative. And there are some technologies out there that are coming to maturation that would work for this. Our Oswald efficiency factor is about 0.8, which is what we're going to use. And then for the two different aircraft, we're going to use slightly different CD knots. And this is because our larger aircraft uh, tend to have slightly lower CD knots than our smaller aircraft. We're stretching it a little bit longer, so our CD knot will come down a tiny bit. Um, because we're aiming it for these longer missions versus something like a, a short range within a, a you know, domestic mission, we'll go a little bit faster. We'll just do Mach 0.84. But that's up to you to choose and use a reference point. Um, our TSFC and cruise, um, because of the larger aircraft, we tend to be able to put slightly larger, higher bypass ratio engines. So we'll see a slight better TSFC. Again, it's up to you to figure that out. Our passenger and bag weight is about 80 and 20, so it's 100 kilograms per passenger. We have two engines. We're going to take a climb and descent credit um, on our main mission of 200 nautical miles and 100 nautical miles on our diversion. Our diversion distance is 200 nautical miles. We have a half hour hold. Uh, the key thing to remember is you always have some amount of unusable fuel. So 5% of our total fuel volume, uh, or 5% of whatever we need to burn for our mission, we need to add in unusable fuel. So we'll show you that in a second. And that's a key hard thing for people to remember and wrap around. So it's not add, um, you know, a little bit here and there. It shows up in the weight segments. So. Uh, these are some example segments, what you would see. So we build up from that mission chart. You have your warm up and taxi. Okay, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second, Jason. We have takeoff, climb, and then cruise, descent, landing, taxi in. And that's our main mission, what we call our standard block. We have our hold, which you, by the way, you can put anywhere in this process. Our climb on our diversion, our diversion cruise, our diversion landing, and then our reserve fuel. If it's 
not colored in a colored box, either red or blue. Those are numbers we just put in. So it's up to you what's the appropriate number. In the case of um, the test you're going to do to exercise to demonstrate the capability of your tool, we will give you these inputs before the test starts. So you will know what to use for those. And these are the ones we're using in this case. OK, so Jason asks, what is climb slash descent credit? So if we go back to our mission rules, when you take off and you climb and descend, you are burning some of that distance that you have to fly. So you're not cruising for that full 4,000 nautical miles or 5,500 nautical miles. Some of that is your climb and some of that is your descent. In reality, what we would want to do is we do a more sophisticated analysis and based on what we would call unflying the mission, where you start your landing and you work your way back up and that, we would ask, figure out what our long range cruise altitude is and see what distance it takes to descend and to climb from and climb to that altitude. And for a long flight, you know, over 500 nautical miles, that comes out to be between 100 and 200 nautical miles in general. So we're just taking a simple 200 nautical mile credit. So what that means is that this long range cruise portion for a 4,000 nautical mile mission is only 3,800 nautical miles. And we're burning 200 nautical miles of fuel in our climb and descent, okay? Next question, what does KIAS stand for? Um, KIAS is, where is it on here? Oh yeah, decelerate to 50, 250 knots KIAS. So K in this is knots. Um, and then IAS is indicated airspeed. You should have discussed that last semester. So this is what you see on your instruments. As a pilot, you fly either indicated airspeed or indicated Mach number. You don't know what the true airspeed is basic reading the instruments. Our modern um, electronic flight decks will calculate our true airspeed, but that doesn't actually matter. As an aircraft, we want to fly at a constant dynamic pressure. That's the most efficient way to fly is to hold our dynamic pressure the same because that gives us the same CL for a given weight. And so we fly a constant dynamic pressure for a given weight. And so we fly 250 knots indicated um, independent of true and it holds true. Once we're Mach limited, because we can't, you know, as the Mach drag effects of going higher Mach number, we'll fly that constant Mach number. But KIS means indicated. Uh, next question. Uh, what makes the fuel unusable? What governs how much? Is it typically a mass or percentage? OK, so unusable fuel is literally fuel that fits in the tanks, in the lines that we cannot use to power our aircraft. It's just kind of dead weight. So if we completely run our tanks dry, um, there's all sorts of problems. We get gliders. You can damage your engines and the like. Also, depending on the shape of our tank and how we're moving, um, there may be fuel that ends up below the point at which we siphon. We drain off the tank. And that is going to be. Uh, varying dependent on the aircraft. You know, some designs will have more, some designs will have less. At the first order for a large commercial transport, it's around 5%. If we have different types of tanks, like you would have on a small GA aircraft, like a Cessna 172, it may be 10 or 15% of our total fuel volume. So it is based on the volume. Now, what that means is that it scales with the size of the aircraft, it scales with the volume of the fuel, and we're assuming that mass, that the density of the fuel is relatively speaking constant. So we just take our fuel fraction and we do a simple multiplication to figure out what our unusable fuel. Oh, uh, I, someone asked, isn't 250 knots the limit below uh, 10,000 feet anyway? Uh, so some countries have quote unquote hard speed limits below 10,000 feet. The US is one of them where you have to have specific permission to fly above 250 knots below 10,000 feet. Others do not have those hard limits. But yeah, generally what we do is when we fly below 10,000 feet, we fly at 250 knots 
or a little bit less than that. And the main reason we do this is just for spacing and to make air traffic control easier. And it's the same reason when you're flying, say, from Manchester to London or New York to Chicago or Chicago to New York, where there's lots and lots of traffic, you're in trail, you don't get to fly at your most efficient cruise speed. You very often fly at, say, the cruise speed of the low, slowest aircraft in that chain, which is usually a 737 or an A320. So if you're flying, a A350 or 787, which would love to cruise at Mach 0.85, but there's 737s and A320s in that thing, you're flying at Mach 0.785 or Mach 0.79, okay? Okay, so let's go back to our, our mission values. Um, so we've got that credit. Our diversion is 200 nautical miles, of course, based on that mission, and it's up to you on your aircraft, how you use it, um, we're going to take a cr credit of 100 nautical miles out of that for climb and descent. And the reason why is we're not going to climb as high. It's not as efficient to go all the way up in altitude in those cases. Um, and we set our hold and half hour is unusable fuel. So, okay. Um, back to this. So our cruise, this is calculated using that modified or simplified brigade range equation. We're going to be using, um, Sorry, oops, went the wrong way. We're going to be using these tech values, the aspect ratio, the E and the CD naught to figure out what our L over D max and consequently our L over D cruise is and our TSFC to burn that. So going over that distance. Uh, the same with our diversion cruise, it's just a shorter flight. And then our hold, which is the endurance equivalent, which you don't need velocity, it is L over D and C and then the weight difference is what you get. And so we start at one, we're at 0.995, we multiply that by 0.99 and you get that. We would land after a diversion weighing 73% as much as we did taking off. Now, I said we have 5% unusable fuel. This is the fuel we would need to load that 26 point something percent is the fuel, 26.8% roughly, of the gross takeoff weight is the fuel we would need to load to be able to fly that mission. In this case, it's a 4,000 nautical mile mission and have stuff for the reserves. So if you don't have stuff for the reserves and all of a sudden the weather's bad, what you don't want to do is run out of fuel and have to put it down in a forest because, you know, that's generally not good. You might end up with a smoking hole and passengers aren't particularly happy when uh, the way they exit the plane is through the big gaping hole in the side of the fuselage. Um, and so we have all that. We need to know what our fuel fraction is and our weight fraction is otherwise. So this is interesting. Anybody know how I got 0.952-ish for my reserve fuel weight fraction? So I told you it's a 5% fuel, unusable fuel. If I divide 1 by 1.05, that 5%, that's 0.952. So it's not 95%, it's a little bit better than that. Multiply that, and that tells you what your weight has to be in fuel. So we have that. Our aircraft now weighs 69.8% of what it did at takeoff. That 69.8% is the mass fraction available for payload and for empty weight. We can now estimate the WE over W naught, our empty weight fraction, based on a guess for a starting weight, and then put our payload in and calculate the mass of the aircraft. So what do these different aircraft for our different scenarios look like? Scenario one, remember this is our 190 nominal passengers, uh, 35, 33 tons maximum payload to 4,000 nautical miles. Given that and those assumptions we had on our tech, we come out at about 91 tons. That was those weight fractions you saw just on the prior slide. Based on our regression that we're using and no special technology in our regression or historical data, um, we know that we're estimating that of that 91 tons, about 44 and a half tons is OEW. 
So a little bit under 50% of the max takeoff weight is going to be operational empty weight. So the rest of it is payload and fuel. So we have 27 and a half tons of fuel in that mission, and we have 19 tons of payload. Now, if we back out based on this starting takeoff weight and trade fuel for payload, so you take off um, approximately 14 tons of fuel and put on 14 tons of payload, we get about 700 nautical miles. So it's not a particularly long-ranged aircraft at max payload. Now, we may be using, uh, instead of 190 passengers, our typical missions might be more like on the order of 220 or so, and that'll be a, quite a bit longer range because 22 tons is a lot less than 33 tons. Um, if we just change the maximum range, the design point at that range where we maximize, we use all that fuel, we're now up to 104 tons. So we've added 13 tons of, payload, of, of MTAU. To do that, we have to add almost six tons of empty weight. Now, why do you think we would be adding six tons of empty weight to this aircraft? What do you think would drive that? Yep, so we need larger fuel tanks and the like. Um, in this case, we may be getting a larger wing. Um, it just depends, it, it, just for efficiency. But in general, what we're doing is we'll be adding, adding larger tanks. Remember, we're redesigning the aircraft. We're not bumping the range by finding new additional fuel. So we're redesigning the aircraft. Our weight of our fuel for that mission is now about 31 tons. So we're only carrying, um, we're carrying only carrying about 3,500 kilograms extra fuel. Um, so we're getting a much bigger OEW. Um, but our range at maximum payload, oh, sorry, this is not the, I screwed that up. This is our bigger aircraft. This is our 225 passenger aircraft. Um, so that's why it's going up. Um, and that's driving that weight up. But we're going a shorter distance. That trade in terms of efficiency and the engines and the like, um, we do get a little bit shorter range at our 40 ton payload. And then these are our two long range options. Um, so this is the map, that maps to that, and that maps to that. And you can see the increase in fuel to go that 5,500 nautical miles. So it is a trade. Now you'll notice we get a lot more fuel load to go the longer distance, the deltas, than they are for the shorter distance um, and adding pa passengers. Remember, we burn fuel exponentially with range and only linearly with payload. So as, as our payload goes up, if we double our payload, we really only need to double roughly the size of the fuel. But if we double our range, we will more than double the amount of fuel we need to carry. Okay, But you'll see these large, longer range aircraft, they have a lot better uh, short range things. And that's just because the aircraft's physically larger and we have more space for fuel. We have much more to trade. Um, we're not just running a, a small trade there. There's a lot more fuel. So if I take off um, 14 tons of fuel, that's still 30 tons of fuel. Um, I can get a, quite a good range out of that. If we look at it on a payload range diagram, you'll see that. So the red and blue lines here are our smaller aircraft. The brown and purple lines are a larger aircraft. And the only difference is just where we set these design points, here, here, and here. And then we back it up. And as you can see, they have the same maximum payloads for the two types, but they just go a slightly different thing. Now, what I have done is I have assumed at this point that the fuel space available, the fuel volume available, is that which we need for that typical mission. In reality, that will never be the case. Your fuel volume is determined first order by how big your wings are. So once you size your wing, based on your takeoff and landing performance and like, you can estimate the amount of volume in the wing you need. Then if you have, you need more fuel for your basic mission, you can add fuselage tanks or later trim tanks in the tail that you use at takeoff cram fuel and you can have extra cargo bay uh, tanks like they used in the A321LR um, to get those extra range. You can always add more fuel, fuel to your, your system than you started off with. 
Um, but that's just a good first order. Um, and in some cases, you'll find when you look at real aircraft, this point is not on the knee, the actual fuel volume limits further back and we're well down on this fuel volume limited. And it's just there isn't more space to add fuel to the aircraft. So all you're doing is you're just taking off payload. And that's acceptable for certain missions in certain cases, okay? Okay. So that brings us to the end of that example. It's a pretty straightforward, simple example. Obviously, when we talk about constraints here in a couple of weeks, we're going to have a longer session on this. Any questions on how to start your problem, your, your tool set for this? Okay. Any any questions in general? Okay, guys. Well, if that's the case, I don't have anything else today. Oh, sorry, there is a question. Um, does our tool assume the initial figure for W0 fractions? Uh, so I'm not sure if you mean the initial figure in terms of Let me go back to that. Are you talking about assuming these fractions here? So these you will assume, you will put them in. I would make them. Um, I would make them values that can be changed in your tool quite easily because you don't know what they're going to be in every situation. You will want to set them as appropriate for your mission um, based on a number of things. These are relatively reasonable, but you might find you need to set something else. Um, and for the quiz, the test, the exam, exam two, you will be given values for these. They may or may not be the numbers you see in these slides here today. So do be able to change them relatively easily. Now, we will give you those values in the instructions or in the, the description for the quiz, so you don't have to start your timer before you can set those in. Um, that you only be awaiting the final ver information on the aircraft you're going to have to analyze when you start the timer. But these will be dependent on the thing. So make them relatively easy to change. If you're doing for your configuration design, one of the options you can do um, in the spec will be you can do more detailed climb and descent calculations and estimates. Um, that's by no means required. If you do it, it's a way to get better, higher marks on the, on the configuration design for your aircraft. Um, based on calculating or iterating on how far you have to go and climb and all of that. Um, but it's not required. But just for the exam and for the, the basic tool use and everybody, you can just put those in as those values or look up appropriate values. Okay. Um, what is WI plus one? And what did uh, you understand? So WI and WI plus one. WI is the mass of the aircraft at the start of a given segment. And W0 is the zero point, so when you just turn the engines on. I plus one is the mass at the end of the segment. So if I start up and I warm up and taxi out to get to the end of the runway, uh, WI plus one, that's zero plus one, that's one, and that's, so that weight, we're at 99.5% of what we started the warm up and taxi with. And we take off, when we're done taking off, just into our initial climb, we're at 99% of what we finished the warm up and taxi. At the top of cruise, we're at 98% of what we were at the, after takeoff. And at the end of cruise, we're at 79% of where we were at the top start of cruise. Okay. So you go zero, one, two, three, all the way down to the end. Okay. Any more questions?
Okay, folks, if we have no other questions, I'm going to say thank you very much for the day. Um, and we will see you for the uh, problem support or the, the coursework support sessions on Thursday. Remember with those, um, you can choose to join and go into your breakout rooms at any time. Um, we're supporting the people in the 12 o'clock hour that are signed to 12 o'clock and in the one o'clock hour that are signed to one o'clock primarily, but you're welcome to use those rooms will remain open for everybody to use during the entire time. This week, you'll go straight into your breakout rooms. We don't have an initial briefing. Um, and so if you have any questions, the GTAs will be coming around or you can summon me in and I'll come and drop by to answer questions and the like. We may broadcast out things if people have any any larger questions. Okay, yep. Anything else? Um, do we use the descent figure as the final value before we do the versionary part? Um, if you were looking at the actual weight um, that you do your diversion, yes, you would do it at the descent figure. The interesting thing is, while these are in order nominally of how a mission would go, so you take off, you land, blah, 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 yeah, and then you land and taxi, and then you